proceed. Order, order. We start with the motion for the unopposed return. Minister to move. The question is to the Secretary of State for Works and Pensions, Duncan Baker. Question number one, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My department does a great deal to support the long term sick and disabled, uh, including through the uh, universal credit and the health element, and also through PIP, which is a contribution to the additional costs of this sickness and disability. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of my constituents, Jennifer Picton, is currently undergoing extensive treatment for cancer and subsequently is unable to work. And I just want to place on the record that I wish Mrs. P Mrs. Picton all the very best with her treatment. Hey, hey, hey. Um, she's come to my office. They have helped with Universal Credit, PIP, and the New Start ESA, and, and she has now managed to get P PIP. But what I want to ask the Minister is why should she have to come to my office, an MP's office, to get help when someone is seriously ill? Why do we make it so arduous and difficult to give people that need treatment and help? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for uh, his uh, question and the typical assiduity with which he takes up his, uh, um, uh, his constituency uh, case? And can I send my best wishes, and I'm sure the whole House, uh, to Miss uh, Picton? I'd be very happy to meet with the honourable gentleman in order to discuss in more detail the circumstances he has described. Why should he go over? Mr Speaker, in response to my written questions on PIP appeals, the data found that more than 50,000 ill or disabled people had their appeal upheld at tribunal without the need for new evidence. Given the UK Government will today be examined by the UN Committee on the Rights of Disabled People following its 2016 special inquiry, which found the threshold had been met for grave and systematic violations, isn't it time, Secretary of State? that the flawed and outdated PIP system is replaced with a framework that is fit for purpose? Well, Mr Speaker, of course, we always keep all benefits uh, under review at the Department, including PIP and the assessment processes. There is, quite rightly, as the Honourable Lady points out, uh, an appeals process for those who are not happy with the conclusions of those assessments. We keep those under review. I can reassure her they represent a relatively small proportion of the total number of applications. Number two, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The regional employment gap is significantly lower than in 2010, and job centres take a place-based approach to deliver targeted support that reflects local need and the local economy. John Morrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Health Equity North research shows that high levels of economic activity due to um, disability or um, ill health in the North East, 40 per cent above the national av average. Now, I visited the job centre in Newcastle. I was very impressed by the dedication and hard work of the staff, but I know from the PSC union that one in four universal, health, universal credit managers had took time off in 2023 for mental illness. That's three times the figure before 2019. So isn't that why we have such high rates? The, the only country in the G7 not to have the same level of employment as before yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. Isn't it because of record NHS waiting lists, low staff morale and general government incompetence? Minister. So uh, what I would say to the lady is that as she found, within our job centres, we have highly skilled people helping people find work. We have a higher number of people with disabilities into work than in 2010, over some 2 million, and also making sure that work coaches can work carefully and sensitively and attenuate to people's needs is what we are intending to do. Stephen Crowd. Speaker, the, the Welsh Affairs Committee in recent months have been hearing from young adults about their expense, experiences with the benefits system. And what struck us is just these group of young people, they want to work, they feel they can work, but have been written off long-term sick, passed to the long-term uh, sickness benefit role uh, by job centres. They feel incredibly let down. Does the Minister agree with me that we can't afford to be signing off so many of our young people with long-term sickness? Yeah, yeah. So I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman. It is why we have WorkWell, the Back to Work Plan, the Fit Note Reform, the Occupational Health Group led by um, Dame Carol Black looking into it. Yeah. It is why we have youth employment coaches, we have the youth hubs, 
We are working to make sure the right attenuated support, including Kickstart, swaps, boot camps. I met Steph only last week, 27, 10 years out of work, and grateful for the help that she had had. On Henderson. Question three, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Job Centre Plus provides a variety of different support to encourage and support people into work, including uh, training, uh, including one-to-one uh, -one face to face counselling uh, by work coaches. Anderson. In February, uh, there were 615 claimants aged 18 to 24 out of work in City Mall in Sheppey. But does my right honourable friend agree that it is important that schools and businesses should work together to ensure young people have the qualifications and skills they need to progress into work once they finish full-time education. My uh, honourable friend uh, Moore, which is exactly why we have uh, youth hubs, for example, providing advice and support, not just on getting into work, but also uh, on other important matters to young people, such as housing, uh, their health and debt management. Emma Hardy. Mr Speaker, I was talking to the RNIB who represent the blind and partially sighted and they told me about an employee who would said, I am newly employed and I am able to fill my role. It has been extremely stressful and frustrating and this is because of access to work. Does the Minister agree that without having access to work in place for within the first four weeks of someone receiving work, it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to maintain that position? Yeah, well, sir. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very uh, pleased that the, the Honourable Lady has raised access to work because it is extremely effective. This is a grant uh, that can be there year in, year, year out, up to a maximum of £66,000. And it is very much that, as part of other approaches, that has led to us meeting our employment goal uh, for disabled people uh, in half the time that we set out in 2017, a million more plus uh, disabled people in work by uh, 2022. Mr. Villiers. Can I um, ask the government what it's doing to use apprenticeships to help young people engage with the labour market and tackle levels of economic inactivity and give them the opportunities they need to get the careers they want? Well, the, my uh, right honourable friend raises economic inactivity, which of course is lower in our country than the United States, France and Italy. It's below the average of the OECD, the G7 and the European Union. Uh, apprenticeships play a very important part uh, in ensuring those, those good figures, though there is, of course, always uh, more to be done, uh, not least through our, our approach of engaging extremely closely with employers, both at the national level and through our job centre. Andrew Gwynne. Thank you. Somebody who has fought really hard over the last four years to overcome the difficulties presented by long COVID. I'm sure the Secretary of State will appreciate that a significant number of people not in work because of health conditions will be down to some form of post-viral fatigue linked to mm -hmm. long COVID. So what assessment has he made of long COVID on the workforce and what's he doing to help people get back to work who have it? Well, the Honourable Gentleman raises specifically long uh, COVID. That is one of the many uh, health pressures that there are uh, in our society and indeed post-COVID in many other countries who were also affected uh, by that uh, uh, virus. In terms of what we are doing, we have a number of approaches including universal support which places people uh, into employment but gives them that critical support for a period of up to 12 months uh, thereafter. We have work well, we're also looking at occupational health and what tax uh, incentives we may put in place to encourage employers to do more on that front as well. So a great deal that we are doing, Mr Speaker. Shall the Minister Alison McGovern? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, um, arguably, the biggest barrier to growth in the UK and turning around the Prime Minister's recession is the supply of labour. So, can I ask the Secretary of State, following the Chancellor's autumn back-to-work budget and all the measures unveiled since, some of which he just reeled off, did the OBR upgrade or downgrade their forecast on employment growth in the budget 12 days ago. One of the most important figures that the Honourable Lady will be aware of in the spring budget uh, EFO, the Economic and Fiscal Outlook, was a recognition by the OBR there will be a net 200,000 more people in employment as a consequence of that fiscal event and the one that preceded it uh, in the autumn. And what the Honourable Lady cannot get away from is that uh, economic inactivity in our country is at a lower level than uh, every year under the last Labour government. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. What the Secretary of State can't get away from is the fact that has already been said, which is that our employment rate has not returned post-pandemic. Yeah. And the reason why he did not answer the question, Mr Speaker, is because the truth is the OBR downgraded their forecast. Right. Unemployment is forecast, the forecast is worse. And the reason why is the truth that the British people have known for a long time now that these ministers sat on the Treasury bench have no idea, no plan for jobs, no plan for growth. They are done, Mr Speaker. It is time for a general election. I've already referred, uh, Mr Speaker, to the 200,000 additional jobs that the OBR does uh, indeed suggest uh, within uh, their forecast. But what the Honourable Lady also cannot get away from is the fact that we have record levels of employment in terms of payroll employment of our uh, country, a near record low in terms of unemployment. Contrast that with Labour's record, which is Labour always leaves unemployment higher than when they come into office. Economic inactivity was higher under Labour in each one of the years of the last Labour government than it is now, and we had more people in absolute poverty after housing costs under Labour as a direct consequence. Agile Bills. Number four, please, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, Speaker. We, of course, are wheeling, uh, bringing forward a number of important reforms within our welfare system. Uh, at PACE, phase one of our universal support has already been activated, phase two by the later this year. Uh, next month, we will be announcing the work well areas, 15 of them, about a third of England that have been successfully uh, selected, and they will, for example, be rolled out live this autumn. Nigel Bill. I thank him for listing all those uh, reforms. I think the, the Secretary of State will know that the data is clear that after 13 weeks out of work, the chances of somebody finding work starts to fall off quite rapidly, and therefore there's a need for more intensive and tailored support. So can you update the House on the uh, part of the additional uh, job centre support rollout, and when perhaps my constituents might get access to those benefits? I'm very pleased to do that, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, AJS, to which he refers, uh, has now been rolled out in parts of the country at six weeks, but will shortly also be uh, extended and strengthened at the 13-week uh, level uh, stage of the uh, unemployment journey for a period of two weeks, and is part of our more intensive uh, conditions that we're applying to make sure that we help and, uh, in many circumstances, require people to go back into work. Tim Farron. Some of the poorest people I know in my constituency work for themselves. Uh, and in many hill farmers had a 41% drop in their incomes over the last four years. And yet the welfare system does not work for them because they are paid less than the uh, minimum wage. Access to, urgent, uh, uh, to uh, universal credit is less for them also because of the minimum income floor. Will he urgently look at that so that small business owners, and especially hill farmers in my constituency, are not made even poorer because of the government's rules? Well, the, the, the right honourable gentleman is, is right in as much as the way that universal credit, of course, works for the self-employed. Is it has to recognise the fact that sometimes there is inconsistent levels uh, of income uh, month to month, and that's why we have a minimum income uh, floor and the arrangements around that. And particularly in the agricultural sector, I recognise, and he has a very agricultural. Uh, uh, rural uh, constituents. I do recognise some of those issues, and it is something that I'm looking very closely at at the moment. Mark Greenwood. Hi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy Sign Language Week, everybody. It is a key priority, Mr Speaker, for DWP to provide effective support for our vulnerable customers. We provide training in how to support customers' mental health, and we have a six-point plan for supporting claimants who may be at risk of suicide or self-harm. DWP regularly reviews processes to make improvements through colleague and customer feedback and through the work of the Serious Case Panel. Margaret Greenberg. The Government had estimated that 3% of households on legacy benefits would fail to move to universal credit under managed migration. However, by December of last year, in fact, 21% had not managed to do so, and as a result had had their benefits stopped. This is a matter of very real concern. DWP is now going to be asking more vulnerable people who are, going, who are wholly reliant on benefits to transfer. What is the Government going to do to make sure that these vulnerable people just do not fall out of the Social Security mm, system? Yeah. 
You know, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for making a point on very vulnerable customers, uh, potentially, who have come into our um, curtilage and purview. And the Minister for Employment has just reminded me that we will be taking this very, very slowly and engaging with customers and supporting them. There is help to claim out there through the Citizens Advice Service as well, so they can speak to people. But we, of course, will be making sure we listen to those vulnerable customers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In addition to the financial support provided to PIP claimants, what progress is being made to proactively refer claimants to the wider support available in their community? Yeah, I thank my honourable friend for highlighting this point because the Household Support Fund helped claim the uh, opportunities to pop into a local library, for example, to get additional support. There's uh, an extra £500 million out there on top of the billion pounds that is there through to the end of this month. So I would say to anybody, benefits calculator is out there and do talk to the CAB and your local council, perhaps in Swindon. WM. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, today the Government is in Geneva defending their policies to the UN's committee investigating the UK for breaches in the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, including Article 28, the right of disabled people for social protection. Given that between 2012 and 2019, when disabled people's social security support was drastically cut, and where austerity was found to be responsible for over 148,000 avoidable deaths, how will the new wave of austerity announced in the budget uh, affect the health and well-being of disabled people? Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to make it very clear to this House the Government is committed to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities and looks forward to outlining the UK's progress in advancing the rights of disabled people across this country. Our National Disability Strategy, the Disability Action Plan are delivering tangible progress. This includes ensuring disabled customers can use the services they are entitled to, as we have spelt out today. Disabled people's needs are better reflected in planning for emergencies as well. We are making sure this country is the most accessible and, importantly, equal place to live in the world. Dean Russell. Thank you. Speaker, I truly welcome and personally am grateful to my honourable friend's support for my campaign for parity between mental and physical health in the workplace and, of course, for the recent publication of the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which referenced two of the points that I've been campaigning on. I understand acutely that the Health and Safety Executive have worked hard on updating first aid guidance and I would be grateful if the Minister could please update the House on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the DWP is also proudly committed to becoming a more trauma-informed organisation, uh, and we will be world-leading on that. I was pleased to see that in Hastings. And the HSE continues to work with us, as the Honourable Gentleman has spelt out, and DHSC, to support the suicide prevention strategy for England. And I can confirm to the House the first aid and mental health guidance on the HSE website has been revised to include text that emphasises emphasises the importance of and the need to consider parity of risks to either mental or physical health. David Dewey. Question number six, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much indeed. The Job Centre team are providing a broad range of support, including partnering with Morrisons and the Co-op to fill local vacancies in your constituency and delivering targeted outreach at Banff Library with local providers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my honourable friend is very aware of the very low un unemployment in Banff and Buchan and the difficulty in filling vacancies with local people, particularly in the food and drink sector. The seafood sector, in particular, is still in a transition away from dependency on overseas workers, which could take some years. What data can the Department for Work and Pensions provide on measures local business ha businesses have taken to maximise the employment of local people, and what other support can the Department offer to attract workers to areas of low unemployment, such as Banff and Buchan? So, thank you very much indeed. Obviously, uh, the wages paid through uh, national, the rise in the national living wage, your local job centre, the range of access to support. But I'm sure we're going to be discussing all these issues tomorrow uh, at the roundtable with the seafood processors, which I will be attending with my, right on, with my honourable friend, the Minister for Legal Migration. Chair of the Select Committee, Sir Stephen Timms. Yeah, there's a large number of people in Banff and Buchan who are economically inactive. They're not claiming benefits, so they're not eligible 
for employment support from job centres, the Select Committee recommended last summer that they should be, wouldn't that be in their interests, in the interests of employers struggling to fill vacant posts at the moment, but therefore supportive of much needed economic growth? I would, t I would um, thank the right honourable gentleman. We always take these matters very seriously and we keep them under full review. Brenda Sharma. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number seven, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I shall answer this question along with question uh, 14. Uh, food banks are independent organisations with DWP having no direct role uh, in their operation. We do, however, uh, monitor the use of food banks through the Family Resources Survey, and the next uh, instalment of that will be later this month. So, Brenda Sharma. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Nearly 50,000 people needed help from Ealing Food Bank last year. 38% of them were children under 16. Amazing that. They and the volunteers are there to help. But a national shame it is needed. What are the government's plan to reduce dependence on food banks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is the government that has seen a reduction in the number of children in absolute poverty of 400,000 since 2010, and I'm afraid, despite the chuntering from the, Bene, from the front bench uh, opposite, under the last Labour government, unfortunately, those figures were far worse than they uh, may be at, at the moment. Um, we are, he asked directly what it is we're doing. We're putting up the national living wage again, by substantially more by, than inflation by this uh, April. The Chancellor has already brought in national insurance uh, cuts that will be worth £900 to uh, the average earner. Benefits themselves are going up by 6.7% as of next month. We also increase the uh, arrangements around the uh, local housing allowance, which will mean that 1.6 million people, many of them, uh, uh, who are in very low income circumstances, will be on average £800 a year better off. Jane Kitchen. Thank you. Uh, while on the campaign trail, I met with the Daylight Centre and Serve in Rushton. Both have seen their numbers increase, and even with the extension of the Household Support Fund, which they both welcome, uh, what can my right honourable friend do to expand the eligib eligibility, improving the uptake, and increasing the, the value of the Healthy Start payment? Mr. Speaker, uh, welcome the Honourable Lady uh, to her place. And in answer to her question, just simply point out that there was much speculation before uh, the spring budget as to whether the Housing Support Fund was going to be extended or yeah. not. Yeah. The Chancellor, in my opinion, took exactly uh, the right approach, yeah. and that has now been extended for a further six months. Peace Buds person, Kirsty Thank yeah. you. Research from the Trussell Trust reveals the devastating truth, though. More than half of people receiving universal credit ran out of food in January and couldn't afford more. And 2.4 million universal credit claimants have fallen to debt because they couldn't keep up with essential bills. Will the Secretary of State back their joint campaign with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and commit to legislating for an essentials guarantee in universal credit to reduce food bank use and ensure everyone has a protected minimum amount of support in order to afford life's essentials? Yes yeah, or no? Yeah. I think the most important thing, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, is that this government recognises that the best way out of poverty, the best way to address the circumstances that the Honourable Lady uh, describes is through work. And that is why uh, the Chancellor reduced taxation, making work pay uh, ever more. It's why the national living wage is to be increased by close to 10 per cent as of this April, following a similar increase uh, this time, around this time last year. My benefits are going up 6.7%, 10.1% this time last year. Uh, local housing allowance I've already mentioned. And of course, we have now had eight consecutive months of real wage growth as inflation has fallen. Hey, please, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The team are working tirelessly with the Borough Council, Tees Valley Combined Authority, and other partners to deliver through job fairs, swaps, and skilled boot camps. Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for that answer and can I be the first in the chamber to wish her a very happy birthday? Yeah. In addition to those issues that she's highlighted, could I highlight to her the wonderful work that Darlington Job Centre has done in setting up their Facebook page and does she consider that this is a template for others to follow and will she come to Darlington and meet with my fantastic work coaches? 
So, uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for what is seemingly quite a large number on my birthday cards today. Uh, my honourable friend has been a fantastic champion for his local job centre and campaigned vigorously to make sure that Darlington's at the forefront of innovation. I am meeting with his team in April, um, and I have been to seven job centres since the last DWP questions, so I'll make sure they are at the front of my list. Jim Shannon. You, uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister obviously in her response to the Honourable Gentleman for Darlington has emphasised what she will do for the job centres in Darlington. Whatever the Minister will do for Darlington, she will also do for the rest of the United Kingdom, and that will be my constituency of Strangford. Can I ask the Minister this question? Uh, can I ask the Minister this question? In relation to how we help each other across this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, how can we work better with the further education colleges to have our young people ready for the jobs that become available? So, thank you very much indeed um, uh, for the question. I talk regularly to colleagues in the Department for Education, making sure that those skilled boot camp swaps make people uh, job ready because they have not only the experience but a guaranteed interview is the way we're driving those numbers up. Heather Wheeler. Thank you very much. Number nine, Mr. Speaker. If I may, Mr Speaker, I will take questions 9, 10 and 19 together. Um, in 2023-24, we will spend over £152 billion on benefits for pensioners in Great Britain, 5.9 per cent of GDP, including a forecast of £125.4 billion on the state pension. And the Weaver. I thank my hon. Friend for his reply. <coughs> South Derbyshire pensioners have been in touch with me following the budget, emailing me that it seemed to offer them nothing. Would it be kind enough to set out today the help that the government has and is giving to pensioners to help them realise that giving nothing is far from the reality of what a Conservative government is giving them? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm grateful for that uh, question. Uh, the answer couldn't be further from nothing, I have to say. This is a government with a proven track record in supporting pensioners, including our commitment to the triple lock. In April, we'll see the state pension raised by 8.5% this year, after 10.1% last year, meaning it will be a full £3,200 higher in cash terms than in 2010. Reg Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the record on supporting pensioners that my honourable friend has just outlined, but a number of pensioners in my constituency have contacted me around the effects of fiscal drag, where they maybe have a very modest private pension that is now being dragged into tax when they never expected it to be. So what steps is my honourable friend taking in conjunction with the Treasury to ensure we can get pensioners on modest private pensions out of tax? Well, this is the government that has nearly doubled the personal allowance since 2010, ensuring that both the lowest earners do not pay income tax. Indeed, thanks to the personal allowance, around 30% of, indiv of individuals do not pay tax. And of course, any pension of reliance solely on the state pension does not pay income tax. Louis French. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my honourable friend agree with me that whilst the Conservatives proudly continue to support pensioners in their hard-earned retirement with the triple lock and other cost of living support measures, it is disgraceful that the Labour Mayor of London has hammered pensioners and working people in Bexley by increasing council tax by approximately £200 per year and the ULES charges of £12.50 per day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm sure he agree with me that the Mayor of London seems to spend more time paying extremely expensive salaries to some of his key employees around, around Greater London. Of course, ULAS has an effect on pensioners. Whether they're going to the shops, visiting their family, attending hospital appointments, they will be the ones to pay the price for his own overweening ambition. Okay, to learn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In early December, my constituent was informed by DWP they must renew their PIP entitlement. They were told that if the necessary forms were not returned by the 13th of January, their pit could be stopped. Then on Christmas Day, the DWP informed my constituent that as the forms had not been returned, their PIP and title had been stopped and they owed some money. My constituent returned the forms early January, long before the deadline. But since then, they've had no response. Neither have received the benefits. Could I implore the Minister to intervene in this astounding case and work up exactly how this error could have occurred? Well, I thank her for that question. If she writes to the, uh, if, she, if she writes to me with the further details, I'm, I will ensure the relevant Minister is able to look into the case. Steve McKay. With uh, more than nine million pensioners now paying income tax. 
many as we've just heard as a result of frozen allowances, and almost a million not receiving pension credit to which they're rightly entitled. Does the Minister think it might be time to improve the uptake of pension credit? Yeah. Well, I'm pleased to be able to say that uh, applications to receive pension credit are currently increasing quarter on quarter. Thanks, thanks. And if you want to just wait and listen to the answer, I'll explain what we're doing. What we are doing to increase uptake of pension credit. Not only do we have major nationwide campaigns, the latest one featuring Harry Redknapp, we're also carrying out experimental campaigns which are writing to all the those pensioners in receipt of housing benefit to make sure that those most likely to be eligible for pension credit are being targeted to take it up. Listen to us. It's all very well people applying for pension credit, but what the well advice centre and my constituency have been identifying is massive delays in people getting the pension credit to which they are eligible. Uh, one person who was in touch with me applied for pension credit for uh, in August 2023. When they got in contact with me in February this year, they were still waiting uh, for that to be resolved, resulting in a backdating of over £8,000. Would that not be much better in the pockets of pensioners who need it right now, rather than waiting indefinitely for the DWP to get back to them? Yes. I'm obviously disappointed to hear of her constituents' uh, experiences, but that's not really one that I hear very often about pension credit rights. We have very excellent uh, delivery record and extremely low levels of complaints. On a fair. Mr Speaker, Southend's indomitable pensioners, WASPy women, Francis Neal and Deborah Dalton, came to see me on Friday on behalf of the 10,000 WASPy women across Southend, with the Ombudsman's final report due now within weeks. Uh, will the Secretary of State please commit to coming to this House to make a statement so that these issues can be fully aired before this House? grateful for the question, as I'm sure she will be all too aware, until the Public Health and Servicemen's Ombudsman's report is published as a minister, I'm not able to comment. Barry Sherman. Mr Speaker, when will this miserable government wake up to the fact that there is a shortage of labour in this skilled labour in this country, at the same time we have pensioners, an army of pensioners, that we could retain in the workforce if they were given the right incentives to carry on work, and is a good relationship between that and keeping them healthy. Will he act? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not sure whether he's volunteering himself for his post commerce career, I don't know. Um, I have to say that there are many job opportunities out there for pensioners across the country. Indeed, many of those working on attendance allowance in my, in my own part of Blackpool, for example, are in their 70s and 80s and doing a fantastic job. We put an awful lot of effort, not just through the midlife MOT, but the older workers' support within our job centres to make sure that we match job seekers to the right job for them. Shadow Minister Jill Furness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Time and time again, pensioners have been let down by this government. They suspended the triple lock, breaking a key manifesto promise. Their disastrous mini-budget knocked hundreds of billions of pounds from pension pots, and their failure to get a grip on the cost of living means pensioners mainly living in cold ho homes over the winter and having the choice between actually heating them or eating. Against this backdrop, is the Minister at all surprised that almost 1, 5, 1 in 5 pensioners are now living in poverty? Yeah. Well, I have to say, to though the uh, Shadow Minister hasn't noticed the cost of living payments that have gone out to pension credit recipients across the country, almost £900 in the last year. I know the benches officers have been reliant upon the Resolution Foundation's report over the past week as they to criticise what we do. Let me just quote to her what the report actually said. Pensioners used to be by far the most likely to be in poverty. Now they are the least likely. This change in the relationship between old age and low income is one of the most profound social and economic changes this country has seen. They've seen it under this government, not her failing predecessor government. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question 11, Mr Speaker. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. We are bearing down on poverty, not least through incentivising work within the benefit system. So, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, we have reduced the UC taper, for example. This has led to a record level of payroll employment and near record level of low unemployment. Thank you. I thank the, the Secretary of State for that answer. I commissioned uh, policy reports on the Arvon constituency from the highly respected Bevan Foundation copies are available online in Welsh and in English. Um, one finding was that of the people getting universal credits, 
and also getting housing benefits in Arvon, 35% for paying the bedroom tax as compared to 21% across Wales. Now, this was cushioned to some extent by uh, the local authority Gwynedd's uh, uh, discretionary help. But will the uh, Minister review the differential negative effects of the bedroom tax between communities, particularly those with a diminished housing stock for rents because of the high levels of holiday homes? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for referring to the report, which I will have a look at uh, with interest. He refers to uh, a bedroom tax. Of course, it's no such thing. It's not a tax at all. It's a spare room subsidy, and it's there for a very good reason, which is that it frees up uh, additional space for those people who need it. But on the housing front, I would say to him, uh, as I said to Honourable Members earlier in my remarks, that the local housing allowance uh, was improved and will be improved uh, come April, such that 1.6 million people on low income uh, in the private rented sector will be on average £800 a year better off. Virginia Cross. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the best ways we can tackle poverty in rural areas like Honest Morn is with jobs fairs. Would the Minister join me in thanking Alwyn Gardner and my brilliant Honest Morn DWP team for organising an excellent tourism and hospitality jobs fair, which was attended by over 150 job seekers in Clangevny and companies like Tradishi in Bumaris and the Breeze Hill in Bentley? Well, can I um, thank uh, my honourable friend uh, for drawing attention to her job fair? She is a local dynamo in terms of standing up for her constituents. When I arrived there recently, Mr Speaker, thinking I was very special to support yet another jobs fair, disability jobs fair, I, I was quickly reminded of the fact that I was the 32nd minister to have been to the Honourable Lady's constituency in, I think, about the last 12 months. Jane Dunstan. Question 12, sir. Mr Speaker, the Supported Housing Regulatory Oversight Act 2023 brings reforms to the supported housing sector to improve quality and value for money. Any changes to funding models would need to be considered in the context of these broader reforms. We do, though, keep the subsidy policy under review. Jane Hunt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Charnwood Borough Council is currently contributing £1.5 million a year to subsidise the supported housing benefit payment to local charities who are unable to become registered social landlords. These charities provide excellent support and accommodation to those suffering from addiction or ex-offenders undergoing rehabilitation. However, the cost to the Council is unsustainable. Please, would my honourable friend look at funding these services as the DWP currently does for similar organisations who are registered social landlords? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank the honourable lady for raising what is a, a challenging fiscal environment. Uh, that means, of course, that centrally we do need to prioritise resources and ensure that support is targeted effectively to maximise the impact for citizens. But I do chair across government a, a group with DLUC on both quality issues and other matters that she's raised in terms of subsidy loss, and we will continue to review and monitor the concerns that she and other local authorities have raised. I would point, though, to the uplift of the LHA, and I've uh, proven in, in this role around housing this is a central focus for me. This is Number 13, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, we treat all claimants individually, recognising the differing needs of health conditions and disabilities, and the impact on claimants' daily lives. The length of time for an assessment is not included in the contract between DWP and providers, but I can confirm to the House that the average time in 2023 was 63 minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was heartbroken to ex- hear the experience of a constituent recently when she had to go through an enhanced medical assessment for PIP. A bowel cancer survivor with severe arthritis, she was made to stay on a phone call to be assessed for over three hours, which meant that, due to her needs, she had to suffer the indignity of soiling herself just to complete the assessment. How on earth can this be OK? I'd like to understand what steps are being taken to reduce the times for these assessments and to hear what can be done to ensure they're finally undertaken with basic human compassion. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, for, for, the, um, for the update on what is a, a distressing uh, case that the Honourable Gentleman has raised. DWP is committed to assessing people as quickly as possible, and I'm happy to look into this particular situation uh, to see why, in this case, the sport that this uh, claimant was entitled 
to it didn't come promptly. Prioritising the reduction of processing times to uh, maximise the number of assessments completed without affecting quality is key, uh, and I'm very happy to take that case away. And Minister Vicky yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The DWP has a staggering 288,000 outstanding PIP claims. Yeah. Average clearance times are currently 15 weeks. People are waiting almost four months for a decision which can have a significant impact on someone's physical and mental health. So what is she doing to improve these clearance times so that people are not left in limbo, worrying about if they can afford the extra costs associated with their disability or long-term health condition? The government urgently needs to get a grip of this. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Claimant satisfaction has remained above the service level of 90% or higher as of the three-month ab- three average, uh, which began in September 2016. And end-to-end clearance times from registration to decision being made is currently 15 weeks, which has been reduced down from 26 weeks in August 2021. But uh, in, the Honourable Lady asked very gently. Uh, what, um, the, uh, what are we doing? We've got multi-channel uh, assessments and I'm doing regular engagement with my officials uh, twice um, a month to make sure that we're assessing the queues and the delays and that we're treating everybody as I open this question individually and in a tailored and suitable way. Please, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I will answer this question along with question number 16. Uh, we are reducing child poverty by a very large number of measures, not least making sure that work pays, uh, hence our increase in the national living wage this coming uh, April and the reduction in the national insurance uh, tax that my <coughs> right honourable friend, the Chancellor, announced recently. Stuart Sue MacDonald. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. 100,000 children will be kept clear of poverty this year thanks to Scottish Government policies, primarily the Scottish Child Payment. Surely he must now look to roll out similar policies in other parts of the UK and, at the very least, ditch the two-child limit, which deliberately forces children into poverty. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the limit to which the Honourable Gentleman uh, refers is there for very good reason, which is that we do feel that those uh, in those circumstances should face the same uh, basic decisions that others who uh, are not on benefits are having to equally uh, face. We think that is an important uh, matter of fairness uh, across those who receive benefits and uh, those who uh, the many who are paying uh, tax. Uh, in terms of the number of uh, children in poverty, of course, that has fallen by 400,000 since 2010. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of them are in work in Secretary State, and £14 million has been paid to over 10,000 children's families in Renfrewshire, thanks to the widely, widely praised Scottish Child Payment. Praise also from IPPR Scotland, who say the Scottish Government is making employment for parents central to its child poverty strategy but that devolved employment support programmes are held back by responsibility being split across governments and a reserve job centre system, which is more often focused on compliance than helping people reach their full potential. So they, they recommend full devolution of employment support to tackle child poverty. Uh, will the Secretary listen to the experts? Yeah, yeah. I'm always very interested in listening to the Honourable Gentleman and any ideas that he has as to how we should improve uh, our welfare uh, system, but I would uh, point to the fact that we have seen a very considerable drop in the level of child uh, absolute poverty uh, after housing in this country of 400,000 uh, since 2010. Richard Graham. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Secretary of State what correlation he sees between children in poverty and workless families? Because given that there is no age restriction on most apprenticeships, today's announcement that there will be 20,000 more apprenticeships that the apprenticeship levy can be spent on greater numbers of contractors and subcontractors. What opportunities does he see for his department to highlight those opportunities for people uh, who are of working age and who may have children in poverty? Well, my, my honourable friend refers to workless uh, households. He's absolutely right about the correlation of five times more likely. Uh, to be a child in poverty if you're growing up in a workless household. And that is exactly why, and he is right to draw attention 
uh, to the announcement that has been made uh, today about even greater investment uh, in apprenticeships and also changing the way the apprenticeship levy works so that supply chains can benefit to a greater degree. Come to Topples, Sir David Dennis. Topples, one, sir. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I join um, uh, the House in uh, saying happy birthday to my right honourable friend, the yeah. Minister for yeah. Employment? It, it should be a, a, a national holiday, as far yeah. as I understand. <laughs> but perhaps, perhaps an idea for a private member's bill or something, something similar. Um, I am very pleased, Mr. Speaker, that since the last questions, we have published our review into autism employment, and I'd like to place on record my thanks to my right honourable yeah. friend the member for South Swindon, who did such excellent work in bringing that very useful report uh, forward. Looking forward from April, uh, Mr Speaker, we will see benefits generally rising by 6.7 per cent, the state pension by 8.5 per cent, the national living wage by around 10 per cent, uh, the household support fund uh, next tranche uh, will also be brought forward. And as I have already set out, Mr Speaker, our plan is working. It means more employment, a historically low level of unemployment and an economic inactivity rate below countries such as the United States, France and Italy. Sir David. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The rate of economic, economic inactivity is at very high levels now, with 2.8 million people citing long-term sickness as a reason. 17 million days of work are lost, and 13 billion cost the economy. Has the Secretary of State seen the Policy Exchange Report published today with policy proposals backed by two of his predecessors, David Blunkett and Chloe Smith? What steps is the government currently taking to improve the provision of workplace health services through occupational health pathways and vocational re rehabilitation? And would it consider the 15 proposals in the policy exchange report? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I will, of course, look very closely at the report that the, uh, my right honourable friend uh, refers uh, to, and uh, I have indeed reached out to him very recently to invite him around the department to have discussions about that uh, and other uh, matters. As regards long-term sickness and disability, there is a whole ar array of interventions that we are working on, including occupational health uh, support within businesses, work well, bringing, towards, uh, bringing together uh, medical interventions with uh, work coaches, universal support to help people into work and stay in work with that support, and of course fundamental reform uh, of the work capability uh, assessment, such that the OBR says 371,000 fewer people will be going on to those, uh, those particular benefits going forward. So, Secretary of State, let's come. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the budget, the Chancellor said he wants to end national insurance contributions because, and I quote, the double taxation of work is unfair. Your NICS record helps determine your entitlement to the state pension. So if that's scrapped, how will people know what pension they'll get? Well, I'm not surprised that the Right Honourable Lady brings this up because I'm very well aware of the position that her party uh, has taken on the announcements that we have made. But she will know very clearly in her own mind that the Chancellor has not guaranteed that we will be uh, reducing at one stroke uh, national uh, insurance uh, contributions. This is an aspiration. It has been spoken about as occurring over a number of years, if not uh, Parliament. So the problems that she's conjuring up to frighten pensioners is nothing short of political scaremongering. I mean, he can bluster and deny all he likes, but the Prime Minister told the Sunday Times, we want to end this double taxation on work. It's there in black and white. So let me try again. How will people's pension entitlement be determined if NICs are scrapped? And if they're going to merge NICs with income tax, what does that mean for pensioner tax bills? Isn't the truth their unfunded £46 billion plan to scrap NICs is yet more chaos from the Conservatives? And Britain's pensioners deserve so much better than this. Well, the Right Honourable Lady, Mr Speaker, says that, uh, and she quoted from the Sunday Times, and I scribbled it down just now, we want to end this uh, double taxation. And, of course, we do. But that is not the same as a near-term near pledge. It is a longer-term aspiration. And, therefore, and we have been quite upfront. Quite unlike, if the Right Honourable Lady would, like, would care to hear, hear me out, 
quite unlike the £28 billion firm commitment that her party made and subsequently you'd upon, you turned upon, which was nothing short of fiscally reckless and would have seen increases in interest rate, increase in uh, inflation, uh, unemployment and so on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, may I extend my gratitude uh, to my honourable friend, the member for Mid-Sussex and Minister, for holding a menopause roundtable hosted by Gatwick Airport, for which I am grateful uh, to them, particularly focused on employment in tourism and hospitality uh, recently. Uh, can I uh, ask uh, what further steps the menopause employment champion will be addressing next? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am delighted about the regional roundtables, including in the leisure sector and hospitality, oil and gas, education, amongst others. It is informing the sector work of the menopause employment champion, and her one-year report is available now, which will showcase a variety of stakeholders, perspectives and outcomes for women who need support. SNP spokesperson Kirsty Blackman. The Resolution Foundation highlights that scrapping the two-child limit would be one of the most efficient ways to drive down child poverty rates and would lift 490,000 children out of poverty overnight. Surely one child growing up in poverty is one child too many. And the Minister, the Secretary of State, should reverse course on this. The Labour Party should also commit to scrapping the two-child limit. Will the Minister agree with me that no child should be growing up in poverty and take action to ensure that this stops now. Well, um, the Honourable uh, Lady raises the same point about the, uh, the two-child limit as was raised by one of her colleagues, and I won't um, detain the House by repeating exactly the same answer, other than to agree absolutely passionately with her that one child in poverty is one too many, and that is why, whilst we have further to go, it is really important to recognise that we have reduced absolute poverty after housing costs by 400,000 children since 2010. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. As Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Disability Group, I thank the Minister for recognising Sign Language Week in the Chamber, which is so important for disability inclusion in the workplace. Will she recommend that honourable members across the House meet the British Deaf Association, who are welcoming people in dining room ages now and who are co-sponsoring? I am delighted to welcome Sign Language Week here uh, in the House, which marks its 21st anniversary, Mr Speaker, and it, uh, which recognised BSL as a language in its own right. And I do encourage members to join the British Deaf Association uh, reception after these questions have ended. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government will move thousands of my constituents across to Universal Credit over the next year, and they will be forced to wait five weeks for their first payment, or up to nine weeks if they receive child or working tax credits. And according to DWP data, 60% of people across Merseyside in this situation will take out an advance loan. So can I ask the Minister, does he think it's right that my constituents, who are among the most deprived in the country, should be pushed into debt or face weeks without the bare minimum they need to, support, to afford the essentials. So I thank the honourable friend for, my, for his question. Uh, the plans to roll out uh, those uh, migration notices uh, by the 31st of March. We intend to publish his constituency data, and we're committed to ensuring the transition works as smoothly as possible for everyone. Lawrence Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Have the Minister made any recent assessments of what kind of trades or occupations are actually short of workers at the moment, and what steps are being taken to persuade people, perhaps more experienced people, back into the workforce to fill those vacancies? So I thank my honourable friend for his question. We're working with other governmental departments, employers and stakeholders to isolate where those vacancies are, work with them on sector-based work academy programmes. We've put over 266,000 people through construction, care, tourism, hospitality, all those gaps that we need to fill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with the migration to universal credit, in terms of tax, people on tax credits, 20% of people currently claiming tax credit are not 
moving over to universal credit. And uh, the Minister's own department tells us that um, the median for people not claiming is that they would have got and tax credit is £3,200 a year. Could the Minister assure me and the House that she is doing everything she can to make sure people are getting the money that they're owed? So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, reassure her completely. We are keeping a close eye on the issue, but ultimately, it's the customer's responsibility to claim. I would gently point out we've been rolling it out in her constituency since May 23, with not one complaint. But there's plenty of help available to those people as they transition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my right honourable friend will know, fast diagnosis and treatment is key to getting people back into work. What representations has he made to his department, his cabinet colleague, to ensure that this is the case? Mm. I thank my honourable friend and near neighbour uh, for her question, because I know that she cares deeply about the issue that she has raised. We work very closely with other departments, DHSC, for example, uh, on NHS talking therapies, which we've announced 400,000 more of those over the next five years. Uh, work well that I've referred to, Fitnote reform, uh, DLUC we're working uh, closely on housing and I've talk, uh, spoken already about the LHA changes coming through and the DFE of course with swaps, training and apprenticeships. Ray Morris. Schools, GPs, social services, charities and housing associations are all able to refer their clients in an emergency to a food bank. Yet this government responsible for benefit sanctions have ordered DWP staff to stop referring claims to food banks. How can ministers justify this decision to the families of 4,027 children living in poverty in my eastern constituency? So thank you, Mr Speaker. May I make it clear that that was just scaremongering. DWP has not changed its policy. These are merely improvements to the signposting slip to comply with our obligations under GDPR. We continue to provide guidance to customers to signpost them to emergency support as it's right to do. Gordon Anderson. Mr Speaker, a couple in my constituency recently received an apologetic letter from my right honourable friend's department that set out a catalogue of mistakes made by the DWP. Those mistakes almost led to them losing their home, which caused them enormous stress. My constituents are now waiting for a decision about what compensation they might receive. Will my right honourable friend look into the case and ensure a decision is taken as quickly as possible to save my constituents from any further stress? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for raising uh, this uh, matter. I obviously cannot comment on an individual case. However, I am very happy to look very closely into the matter uh, that he has uh, raised, uh, and either I or a relevant minister will be very happy to meet with him. The number of long-term sick has risen from 2.1 million pre-pandemic to 2.8 million today. The huge increase started in spring 2021, at the same time as the rollout of the experimental emergency use vaccines. Or does the Minister have an alternative explanation for the unprecedented rise in long-term sickness in the UK since spring 2021? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, in fact, the, one of the major drivers of uh, this uh, increase to which the Honourable Gentleman refers is actually mental health issues, musculoskeletal issues as well. And I think I'm not entirely sure that he's accurate when he says that the upward trajectory in those numbers actually occurred just as vaccination occurred. I think it predated that moment. And I certainly do not subscribe to the view uh, that vaccination is in any way unsafe. Neil O'Brien. Speaker, for many years the Department published statistics giving a breakdown of welfare claims by nationality. Although the Department still has the data, it no longer publishes the statistics. Will the Minister look again at this and start publishing these important statistics once again? So I thank my honourable friend, um, but would like to inform him at the moment there are no plans to recommence the publication of these statistics. Mike Gainsbury. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The last Labour Government uplifted a million children out of poverty. After 14 years of Tory government of a million children in destitution, what's gone wrong? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I have to take issue with the Honourable Gentleman. He needs to look more closely at his own party's record in government. 
The Labour Party always leaves office with higher unemployment. Fact number one. Fact number two, economic inactivity in our country is lower than any year under his party's time in office. Fact number three is that absolute poverty has declined in our country compared to when his party was in office. Fact number four is that there are now more uh, there were more children in workless households on his watch than on ours, and perhaps most tellingly of all, under his party's time in office, almost a million people, or over a million people, languished on long-term benefits for almost a decade. That is a disgraceful record, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one of the most challenging groups of people to get back into the workforce are those people in their 50s and 60s whose jobs disappeared during COVID and they've possibly fallen back onto their personal pensions, but of course with inflation that's now being eaten away. So what actions is my right hon. Friend taking to actually get those people back into work, encourage them to back into jobs that are valuable, as well as improving our productivity? So I thank my hon. Friend for that question. I would um, ask people to go to their job centre who can help them build their CVs, build their confidence. We have 50 plus champions across all districts. We have midlife MOTs. And I, for one, think working in your 50s and now my 60s yeah, is a yeah, very good you. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The two wellbeing hubs in my constituency in Brora and Dunbeath are crucial to the wellbeing of pensioners. They signpost the best mix of pension of benefits, and they are a last safety net. But their future is uncertain because of the vagaries of NHS Scotland finance. My request is simple: Would a minister meet with me to discuss how we can safeguard the future of these two centres? It's devolved here in the room. Always happy to, happy to meet with the honourable gentleman. We sit next to each other every morning, almost in Portcullis House. I'm sure we can have a conversation. Rob Butler. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Aylesbury is a wonderful place to live, work, visit, and invest. But sadly, we do have some areas of uh, economic uh, deprivation. Opportunity Bucks, which is run by Buckinghamshire Council, has identified Aylesbury North and Aylesbury North West as areas for extra attention to improve education, training, and skills. How can my right honourable friend's department assist initiatives like that to get more Aylesbury residents into work? So I thank my honourable friend for his question. As I say, we're working with employers, with job centres, on swaps, on boot camps, but I'd be more than happy to visit him in Aylesbury and talk to his job centres and employers to see how we can encourage that more. That completes questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 